So welcome to everyone, uh, visitors and members of our students and faculty. Uh, this is a wonderful Friday afternoon before the national holidays that we'll begin to celebrate very soon here. Um, it's a special honor and privilege for me as rector to introduce a distinguished friend. And uh, I often introduce distinguished visitors to the university, but it's especially nice to say also introducing a very distinguished friend. Eleni Tsikopoulos Kunalakis has been the U.S. Ambassador to Hungary since January of last year, and from my point of view, it looks as if she's been here much longer because she's accomplished so much in such a short period of time. I think you're all aware of, of how visible and active she is in Hungary. Uh, she's a very dear friend of this university um, and very, uh, I'm honored to say, a frequent visitor. Most recently, she came and was a lecturer in my class uh, just about two weeks ago. Um, and it, it was a special uh, opportunity to hear the perspective of uh, the United States government at that time on the developments in uh, North Africa and the Middle East, as well as uh, all over the world, many of which you'll hear about in just a few minutes. Um, I want to say that uh, Ambassador Kunalakis is really part of a new generation of young American leaders who President Obama has brought into his administration. It's a very exciting moment in the United States because of this uh, new generation of leaders of great diverse backgrounds uh, from all parts of our country and, and certainly all parts of our society who are uh, bringing a great vitality, I think, to, uh, to the United States government as they come into government. And, and I'm particularly pleased that Ambassador Kunalakis is in that category and therefore we in Hungary are especially pleased to be able to see the kind of vitality that is, that is being brought by President Obama and, and bringing new, new generations in who may not have previously been involved in public affairs. Uh, despite her youth, uh, Ambassador Kunalakis has uh, long been very active on issues of democracy and freedom of speech and the rule of law and equal opportunity, which are really at the heart of her mission here in Budapest. Uh, two weeks ago, she published a, an op-ed in the Hungarian press about the importance of freedom of the media, which is, of course, a topic that's uh, very much on the minds of Hungarians and all of us who, who live in, in Budapest. Last week, as I said, she was a guest lecturer in my course. Uh, before becoming ambassador, she was the president of one of California's largest and most respected a development, real estate development companies. So she has a, a long uh, a history and involvement personally in, in business, and so she brings a sort of business acumen to her work as ambassador. She's also got a distinguished record of public service. Uh, she was the California State World Trade Commissioner. Of course, California is, I think, about the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. I'm not sure I've got that number right, but it's certainly a large economy in any event. Um, she's been a trustee of the San Francisco Performing Arts Center, so she's very involved in issues of the arts, a member of the California Democratic Committee, and four times uh, a delegate to the Democratic National Convention, which is the, uh, the political convention of the Democratic Party, which just uh, th two years ago produced uh, as its candidate, President now President Barack Obama. I, I know she's very proud of her Greek-American roots and her, root, her, her, her active role in the Greek-American community, which is uh, one of the wonderful aspects of the tapestry of her country. With her husband, uh, Marcos, who is also a friend, she has endowed academic chairs in uh, Hellenic studies at two of America's great universities, uh, Georgetown University and Stanford University, and has also been very active in supporting uh, Hellenic studies issues at uh, Princeton University at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, so I think our secret to being able to attract you back so frequently, uh, not only I hope that you like our university, but that uh, we have a special reason for you to come back, which is that your sister 
is a student at CEU in uh, legal studies in the master's program in human rights. And uh, I was pleased to have your sister in my class this year. So um, without any further ado, let me uh, welcome and ask you to join me in welcoming. And, and one last quest point before I turn the microphone over. There have been a paper, I think, has been circulated in the audience. So if you have questions for the ambassador, please write them down. We expect there'll be many questions. So they'll be collected. And then as moderator, I will make sure that they, were, they are worked through and they are properly addressed. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Tsukopoulos Kunalakis to CEO. Thank you, John. You are much too kind. I only have one correction I feel compelled to make, which is uh, my husband and I have a lecture series at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, not the Woodrow Wilson Center with Princeton. I wouldn't want anyone to think, as a former Dartmouth alumni, that Princeton <laughs> were uh, one of the uh, universities that I'm affiliated with. In in fact, when we, my husband and I established a chair at Stanford, Stanford stole the uh, chair of the classics department from Princeton to bring him to Stanford. So I'm not in very good standing with him at all. Uh, Thank you all very much for having me here. Uh, I was uh, the guest speaker in Rector Shattuck's class a few weeks ago, and I enjoyed it so much, and I especially enjoyed hearing the questions from the students. So I'm going to uh, give a, a broad overview and perspective, but at the end, I really do welcome all of your questions, and, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer just about anything you want to throw at me. Um, so I was asked to speak primarily today on the United States' relationship with Europe and also with Hungary in the context of Hungary's EU presidency. I would start by saying that we view our relationship with Europe, including with Hungary, as critically important. And as President Obama has said, Europe is the cornerstone for our engagement with the rest of the world. However, we have to realize that the nature of the transatlantic relationship is now different than it was 10, 20, 30, or 50 years ago. For most of the latter half of the 20th century, Europe was divided. Institutions such as NATO and the EU's predecessor, the European Coal and Steel Community, were founded to relieve tensions between the nation states. In Western Europe, we focused on the post-war recovery and then on building institutions to effectively counter the Soviet threat. Hungary and Eastern Europe were behind the Iron Curtain and the bipolar dynamic shaped our world. Then in 1989, the wall fell. The Soviet Union dissolved two years later, and the process began of reuniting Europe. Central and Eastern European nations spent the next decade and a half reforming politically, economically, and militarily, while integrating into European structures. NATO had to change with the times as well. No longer was it one alliance staring down another across a divided line, but now instability was coming from regional conflicts, a lesson we learned all too painfully in the Balkans. Nonetheless, the trajectory of Europe over the last 20 years has been exceptionally positive. As it is in the United States' interest to see a unified and strong Europe, we support initiatives such as the Lisbon Treaty that help give rise to a louder, single European voice. We support the efforts of High Representative Catherine Ashton toward creating a more consistent, comprehensive, and effective European foreign policy. The EU has shown that it increasingly wants to and is capable of addressing pan-European challenges. From the integration of the Western Balkans to supporting democracy across the EU's eastern border to promoting energy security and equality of opportunity for all of Europe's citizens, including the Roma, we see strong European leadership. And as you will have noticed, 
Hungary specifically has identified these areas as priorities for their EU presidency. I'll talk more about how the United States can play a supporting role a little later, but the point I want to make now is that with a strong European partner, the focus of our attention can increasingly turn from how we work with Europe on European matters to how we can work with Europe on global issues and combat common threats. This is critically important since the 21st century world looks far different than the 20th century world. If we step back and try to see the world from the Washington point of view, what do we see? Well, in the Middle East and beyond, we see a yearning of people by people for representative and accountable governance, which is colliding with authoritarian rule. We see Iran and North Korea continuing to work on their nuclear programs and presenting serious proliferation concerns. We see China and India emerging as economic powerhouses. We see instability in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we also see stateless terror, drug and criminal networks operating around the globe. So taking all this in, we think to ourselves, where do we begin? And the first thing we realize is that we need partners and friends, and Europe is the first place that we look. We may not always agree with Europe on every issue, but I challenge you to find any closer allies or natural partners. We share the same values and have a similar worldview. We believe in openness, transparency, and the rule of law. We believe in the fundamental rights of freedom of expression and assembly and the freedom to choose and practice one's own religion. The strength and legitimacy of the United States and Europe is vastly greater when we work together than when we try to do things alone. So when talking about specific issues, the most appropriate place to start right now is in the Middle East. Secretary Clinton recently said, Americans are in favor of human rights, freedoms, and democracy. We know that ultimately the most progress that can be made on behalf of human beings anywhere is when those individuals are empowered, when they have governments that are responsive. We want to see reform go forward across the region. We want to see it done peacefully, without violence. We want to see, see it be inclusive and we want to see movement toward democracy. Obviously, the situation is playing out far differently based upon local circumstances. While there is co a common theme of individuals, communities, and entire nations standing up and demanding to be part of the political process, these events are local in nature and reflect the specific situation in each country. This is a challenge for American diplomacy and for European diplomacy. While the events in Egypt and Tunisia were colored with some violence, the full force of the military was not turned on the population, as is happening now in Libya. Our responsibility in Libya does not end with the evacuation of American and EU citizens. There is a significant human element with refugees crossing Libya's borders a need for humanitarian assistance to people in different parts of Libya, and the need to enforce internationally accepted political decisions such as the arms embargo. NATO defense ministers met yesterday in Brussels and discussed how best the organization can use its assets and capabilities, especially in regard to the humanitarian response and enforcing the arms embargo imposed by the United Nations Security Council. As far as future steps, NATO Secretary General Rasmussen said that decisions will be based on three criteria, demonstrable need, a clear mandate, and solid support from the region. The refugee situation is a particular concern. Hungarian State Secretary for European Affairs, Enika Jury was in Tunisia last week with the EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid, helping to coordinate assistance to help transport 
the large numbers of refugees home. Significant process has been made on this front. The United States has committed $47 million to the relief effort, including $13 million to the International Organization for Migration to help transport thousands of third country nationals home. We also provided military flights to transport 800 Egyptians from Tunisia to Cairo. We are also working with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the International Committee of the Red Cross to provide basic and emergency services for those most in need. We don't yet know what the end result will be in Libya. But the one thing that is clear is that Gaddafi has lost all legitimacy and needs to leave immediately. As for the other countries in the region, there have been changes, but as of yet, there is no secure path to economic and political reform. All we have to do is look back to 1979 and Iran, which began with popular protests against the Shah and see how the hope of that time was hijacked. I'm not saying that we are facing a similar outcome here, but it is important to keep in mind that democracy is about more than just an election. It requires institutions such as independent judiciaries, freedom of the press, and protection of minorities. It requires the rule of law, not of oligarchs. As the transitions go forward, we will work with our counterparts in the region and give advice where we can. But ultimately, neither the United States nor Europe will decide what happens within these countries. As outside actors, all we can do is offer our support and advocate for meaningful and transparent processes that produce results. The Middle East is not the only region where we face challenges and have to answer the question of how best to advance our security, our interests, and our values. We have to deal with countries across the political spectrum, some with world outlooks and values far different from our own. Take, for instance, the complex relationships the United States and Europe have with China. On the one hand, we advocate for human rights and political reform, and on the other, our economies are increasingly interdependent. And that takes us to President Obama's top foreign policy priority, and the top priority for many of our allies, and that is Afghanistan. As Secretary Clinton said on February 18, we have made progress, but the tribal areas along the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan remain the epicenter of violent extremism. Despite losses, Al-Qaeda terrorists retain dangerous capabilities and continue to plot attacks and support and inspire regional affiliates. While distinct groups, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, still maintain an alliance and the Taliban continues to wage a brutal insurgency against the government in Kabul. After taking office, President Obama launched a thorough review and set a clear goal to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat Al-Qaeda. With that objective, we are following three mutually reinforcing tracks, a military offensive against Al-Qaeda terrorists and Taliban insurgents, a civilian campaign to bolster the governments, economies, and civil societies of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and an intensified diplomatic push. Progress on the first two tracks helps the third, which supports an Afghan-led political process to split the weakened Taliban off from al-Qaeda and reconcile those who will renounce violence and accept the Afghan constitution. All three tracks set the stage for the transition plan that NATO endorsed in Lisbon, in Lisbon to shift responsibility for the future of Afghanistan to the Afghans. In the end, they must provide security, strengthen government, governance, and reach a political solution to end the conflict. The transition will be formally launched this month with troop reductions beginning in July and continuing based on conditions on the ground with a target date for completion at the end of 2014. Over the last two years, we laid down the red lines for reconciliation with insurgents. They must renounce violence, cut ties with al-Qaeda, and abide by the Afghan constitution. If former militants are willing to meet these conditions, they would be able to 
participate in the political life of the country. This process will become increasingly viable as Afghan leadership strengthens across the country, but it is dependent on all of Afghanistan's major ethnic and political blocs having a stake in the outcome and a responsibility for achieving it. It will require participation and support of Afghanistan's neighbors, first and foremost, Pakistan. As we have underscored from the beginning, Pakistan is crucial to the success of Afghanistan as pressure needs to come from both sides of the border. While we have not always seen eye to eye with Pakistan, growing cooperation and action by the Pakistani army has had its results. We have expanded our civilian efforts in Pakistan through the Kerry Luger Berman Assistance Program to help meet Pakistan's urgent energy and economic needs and quickly responded with help following the devastating floods last year. On the civilian side in Afghanistan, a major focus has been to expand our presence in the field and get more experts to provide hands-on leadership on development projects. Efforts like Hungary's Provincial Reconstruction and Mentoring Team in Baglan province are key to this strategy. We are working with Afghan institutions to help them improve auditing and accountability. But corruption, fraud, and waste are still problems and are a high priority for us. While the transition will end in 2014, our commitment to Afghanistan will not. NATO has pledged an enduring military and financial commitment Knowing and knowing the stakes, remembering the horrible terrorist attacks of the last decade, we cannot and will not abandon Afghanistan. Coming back to this continent, Budapest, I would like to say a few words about the Hungarian EU presidency. It was unfortunate that the start of the presidency was somewhat clouded by the debates surrounding the media law, since Hungary has put forth a number of priorities that the United States views as extremely important and that we would like to see advance during Hungarian leadership. Among them is the continued political and economic integration of the Western Balkans into Europe, including the accession of Croatia into the European Union. Of course, meeting the membership requirements is up to each candidate, and the decision to grant admission lies with the EU. But as a friend of the EU and with such high stakes, such a stake in the region, we believe that the EU membership brings stability as well as contributes to the social and economic development of each country. In addition, we value the emphasis that Hungary has placed on the EU's Eastern Partnership Initiative. I know there is some disappointment that the summit was delayed and will now take place under the Polish presidency, but Hungary will still be a co-host and will help to shape the agenda. Last year, the United States allocated $310 million just last year alone in the EPI region, in addition to our assistance to Georgia and a five-year $262 million Millennium Challenge corporate compact with Moldova aimed at reducing poverty and accelerating economic growth through infrastructure and agricultural programs. Our goals of supporting civil society development, promoting health and education, bolstering peace and economic growth are very closely linked to the Eastern Partnership Initiative platform as well. By closely coordinating our assistance, we can and do maximize our impact. Another very important agenda item is energy security and the development of a common EU energy policy. As you may know, the US and the EU formed an energy council in 2009. Secretary Clinton noted at the council meeting last November that we've already achieved a great deal, including working to secure new sources of natural gas for Europe and working with Ukraine to become a more reliable partner for Europe. Beyond the search for new sources of fossil fuels, we also have the opportunity to make the US and the EU leaders the opportunity to make the US and EU leaders in developing new and more efficient technologies. That requires ensuring that our markets are interconnected, transparent, and competitive. And finally, we are pleased to see the emphasis that Hungary has placed on promoting the development of a framework 
European Roma inclusion policy. As Secretary Clinton said last April, protecting and promoting the human rights of Roma everywhere has long been a personal commitment for me. And under the Obama administration, it is a priority of the United States. It is the job of governments to combat discrimination, prejudice, and marginalization of all persons, including the Roma. Related to this, I would like to say a few words about the importance the United States places on empowering women and girls, especially since International Women's Day was only a few days ago. Supporting the rights of women and girls is a cross-cutting issue with relevance to many of the priorities I have already described. Secretary Clinton said in a recent interview, I believe that the rights of women and girls are the unfinished business of the 21st century. I believe that we have like-minded partners in the European Union in addressing this priority. If we are to build a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world, we cannot leave half of the population behind. We cannot successfully tackle the challenges that confront us in relation to the environment, security, economics, development, and more if women are not engaged in every level of society. The United States is committed to the empowerment of women not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it is the smart thing to do. When women make progress, countries make progress. So, as you can see, our agenda is wide and diverse, and while China and India may attract headlines, it is Europe that is standing by our side on every issue. President Obama stressed that the United States would act in partnership with the rest of the world, and only in partnership will we be successful. And on that note, I'm going to conclude my prepared remarks and open it up to your questions. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful and very complex tour of a very complicated world. Um, and I think uh, you have elicited quite a number of questions, as you could imagine, sure. from what you've told us. Um, and I will simply be the person who connects the audience with the ambassador by reading some of these questions, if I may. Um, why don't we take them uh, one at a time for the moment, and then maybe we'll pile them up a little bit if we get out of time. So the first question uh, is, Madam Ambassador, what does the U.S. expect of Hungary as the EU president to do in solving the crisis in Libya? Were you having consultations with the Hungarian foreign ministry about the U.S.-Libyan policy, and what were you focusing on? Um, well, yes, absolutely. In fact, today and tomorrow, you may know that um, the foreign ministers from the EU are in Hungary, out at Gudula, for conversations. And of course, the issue of Libya is very high up on the agenda. Um, and uh, Minister Martigny, um, just to uh, say for those who don't know, is a very, very well-respected member of um, the diplomatic world of Europe. In fact, even prior to um, the presidency, Lady Ashton had asked him to represent Europe at the, um, it was the ASEAN, is that right, Ed? Was it ASEAN or it was um, APEC? Uh, he took the ASEAN. Yeah, to the ASEAN conference as Europe's representative, even before Hungary had the presidency. So you have very capable diplomats here, and, uh, and Minister Martigny is deeply engaged. And as a result, of course, he and I have the opportunity to talk about the situation. It is a situation that is evolving very rapidly. And I believe that Hungary, in its leadership of, uh, of role right now, is engaged um, with Europe as they, as Hungary is engaged with the United States in the evaluation of all of the options. Um, and options are being evaluated. So, um, so I, I think that may have answered your question. Um, we do talk regularly, and we have very, very high confidence in Hungary's leadership on the issue. 
So here's, a, here's an interesting question. How would you describe the role of NATO and the North Atlantic Treaty Association for young students to understand? Why should this institution be supported? Well, I think that, first of all, to understand NATO, a young student would need to know a little bit about the history of post-World War II Europe, um, and particularly in this part of the world where, uh, where, where Hungary was, was, uh, was part of the, um, was behind the Iron Curtain. Um, there would have to be a basic understanding of that time, and essentially that NATO came into being in order to help the United States keep a presence in Europe and help support uh, Western Europe against additional threats from the Soviet Union at the time. I mean, I don't think I'm going out on a limb by classifying that as the main reason for the establishment of the alliance. Uh, I, have, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Madeleine Albright about NATO um, just before, a few weeks before I came out to Hungary. Um, many of you know she was uh, Secretary of State under Bill Clinton, and she also is Czech American and uh, was born in Czechoslovakia, and her father was a professor, and this part of the world is very dear to her. And after the, uh, 19, the events of 1989, there was real discussion about whether or not NATO needed to continue to be in existence or whether it could basically, the alliance could fold up and go home because the threat, the main threat of the, of the time um, had, uh, had dissolved essentially. And Madeleine Albright was one of the key people, if not the key person in advocating not just for NATO, the NATO alliance to continue in existence but also to expand. And I mentioned in my remarks uh, the Balkans but the fact of the matter is that who would have thought in 1989 that the first time, the first and only time Article 5 of NATO would be uh, invoked would be after September 11th, that it would actually be an attack on the United States that would invoke Article 5 of NATO. So um, it has turned out to be, certainly from the United States perspective, a very valuable alliance. But I also believe that um, the continued expansion of NATO has proven to be very useful for stability uh, and unification, really, in Europe. Um, many times when I'm talking to Hungarians about the transatlantic relationship, the NATO membership looms very, very high in their feeling not just that they are valued uh, by their friends, now allies, um, but also that they feel a sense of, of developing their own defense posture in concert with being part of an alliance that is far bigger than just themselves. I'll just add one small footnote of history, which is that I, I happen to be the U.S. <laughs> ambassador in the Czech Republic at yeah. the time that uh, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Poland became new members of NATO. Uh, and just before that, I had been the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State in, and uh, connected with the Balkans. And if there ever was a, more, a powerful example of why NATO was important, it was in ending finally, and much too late in my view, but, but nonetheless importantly, the war, the horrible genocide that was going on in the Balkans. And I think the role that Hungary uh, played in that uh, that activity as a member of NATO was absolutely central and something that Hungarians uh, need to remember because it was a very important role in ending that genocide. Can, can, I, can I just also mention that because believe it or not it came up today um, when we were talking about Hungary's role in, in a wide variety of things and the fact is that the United States called um, then Ambassador Blinken and asked him to reach out to the Prime Minister about, in very, very short order, establishing a base in southern Hungary at Tazar in order to be able to operate um, the, the uh, operations, the forward operations. And uh, if you've read Ambassador Blinken's book, you'll see that the turnaround time and the setup of that base and that capability for the operation happened almost overnight, just at lightning speed. And, and we don't forget it. 
we at the U.S. Embassy in Hungary, it is very much part of, you know, the people change, the ambassadors change, the staff changes, but things like that, they, they, are, never, they are never lost in the shuffle. So here's a, here's a nice softball question. What was discussed at the recent meeting with all of the U.S. ambassadors in Washington with Secretary Clinton? <laughs> What secrets can you divulge? <laughs> this is your WikiLeaks Who's moment. Who's got the better house? That kind of thing. <laughs> no. Um, well, what was discussed? Um, we were brought together, um, and in fact, it was it was established that we would all come together as Secretary Clinton released something called the QDDR, the Quadrennial. That's the only word I've got of QDDR. But essentially, it was a plan. It's a plan, it's a new initiative that Secretary Clinton had put together whereby um, her primary, her premise was the world is changing, NATO has just reevaluated the way that it needs to go about uh, organizing itself and preparing for the, the threats of the 21st century. The State Department needs to think about how we operate and how we perhaps should be operating differently in order to be, be able to meet the new challenges. That's why we were brought together. It just so happened that as we were all making our way there, of course, events in Egypt were um, reaching their, their peak, um, which reminded us all as we came around to talk about you know, at a time where everyone re everyone thought we were coming during a real downtime, you know, February, not a lot's going on. Uh, and of course, um, things were changing very, very rapidly in, in, in Egypt. Um, but I'll tell you, it was really an opportunity of a lifetime. It was the first time that all American ambassadors from around the world were brought together at the same time. Ordinarily, we meet by region. And so when I usually go to these um, meetings a couple times a year, they're with other ambassadors to Europe and Eurasia. Uh, having us all together in the same room was really an incredible, incredible experience. And, you know, I, uh, it's sounding stranger and stranger to me, John, to be reminded that oh, a little over a year ago I was a land developer <laughs> because my life has changed so much since I joined um, this administration. And, uh, and it has been an all-encompassing experience for me. Uh, but the one thing that is very fresh with me, and I think about every single day, is that in spite of the facts that sometimes the United States gets things wrong, I think we'll be the first to admit it, that the work that we do around the world, the effort, the money, the, the, the sheer force of our men and women of the State Department um, is extremely important. And, and, I, and I don't say that in order to ring our own bell. But just as an example, we have almost 400 employees at Embassy Budapest. It is only a medium-sized embassy. And we are prepared for just about anything. So for instance, when immediate evacuation needed to take place out of Egypt, uh, our embassies in Greece and in Cyprus were on overtime. And even staff from the embassy in Budapest uh, went down in order to help with the evacuations in Egypt. So it is a network around the world that um, first and foremost attempts to understand the rest of the world and bring that understanding back to Washington, and secondly, be prepared to act when and if necessary. Here are a couple of questions. There are a number of questions about Hungary, not surprisingly, and I think you're especially qualified to answer those questions. What is your opinion about the ongoing consultations on the new Hungarian constitution? Is the social discussion satisfying, in your opinion? And then a second question, how would you assess the relationship of the present Hungarian government with the United States, especially in light of the first few months of the Hungarian EU presidency? Um, there may be some others coming along, but let's let you. <laughs> all right. Well, do look, those I think I, can, I think I can maybe answer that question in a holistic way for all of you, and that is that I, I find myself when I answer questions of this nature, starting with the with the fact, which is that the world and the people around the world who look at these and monitor these things, certified that the election that was held here last spring 
was a free and fair election. And I think it's very important that that fact not be lost because it is an unusual circumstance that you would have this type of, 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 of landslide election where 67% of the seats in parliament would go to essentially one party. I mean, you can't even really call it a, a, a coalition. Uh, it's a very unusual circumstance. But where I go first and foremost is that I start by respecting the will of the people that voted to hand a supermajority to one party. So I think it's really important to remember that. Now, because there are so few examples in Europe, in the United States, anywhere, of a free election handing so much authority to one party, now you, you come into um, new territory. So my understanding, my last count, is that since the new government came into power, they have passed 170 new laws, including some very controversial things that have raised the, uh, the, the uh, interest of Europe and of the United States. Um, so the, the pace of change that's happening here right now is, 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 is unlike anything that you really see um, commonly. Uh, so for instance, on Wednesday, I opened up the, my news clips and saw that in addition to everything else, the name of the country might change. You know, these are, these are enormous things that are happening very, very quickly. Um, but I also think it's important to say that Hungary long ago graduated from the United States programs of establishing democracy and that we believe that Hungary is a healthy, healthy and fully functioning democracy. So that is, I want to be clear about that. When you start looking at the individual acts, like the establishment of the Constitution or otherwise, then, just to peel back the onion further, we as the United States have to ask ourselves, when is it appropriate for us to engage in the political decisions that are being made in, in a country? You know, the United States does not interfere with the internal political decisions of the countries where we are, where we are hosted. And so I think that's another thing that's, that's really important, is that the question for me as the representative of the United States can't be, well, what do you think of these policies relative to President Obama's policies and positions in the United States? Because there are plenty of differences there, I think it's safe to say, but we would never comment on that. We would only comment when you're in a situation where, uh, where at, at a much bigger, broader question we are asked about uh, about things that are happening here. And so it's within that context that I'll answer the question about the Constitution. We believe that there are very capable people in this country who can, who can put together a Constitution that is a good Constitution for the people of Hungary, and one that protects your rights to freedom and freedom of expression and to freedom of the press and to uh, the rule of law. We believe that absolutely. Where it ends up in some of the decisions that I would say get into the political realm, the only thing that I would say about that is that in the United States experience, a constitution is a strong constitution when it envelops the opinions of the country that it is, the, uh, it, it, where, where the citizens are being represented. So um, Anthony Kennedy, one of the United States Supreme Court justices, came out to visit last summer. And we had um, these very interesting meetings with government officials who at the time already were contemplating their new constitution. 
And the point that he came back to again and again is that it's not that you're going to have the support of every individual. You know, that's not, that's not the question. The question is, is that the document itself and the language of the document itself and the law that's put forward in the document itself does not exclude people. And so, so I feel comfortable commenting, commenting at that level. But the work uh, that needs to happen now is the work of the government, the representatives, and of the Hungarian people. Let's, let's shift back to the, uh, the Middle East and particularly uh, what's happening in North Africa. And here is a question. What are the lessons learned from reviewing 40 years of providing billions of dollars to the likes of Gaddafi and Mubarak, how will that affect U.S. policy? Well, you know, it's... Um, really, I, I'd like for you to answer that question, John, because <laughs> as mentioned before, I was the land developer a year and a half ago, and you were <laughs> Assistant Secretary of State of the United States. Um, you have a much longer, broader understanding of these things. And, and since someone did ask, John, maybe you can share your perspective. Um, what, what I spend my days on is trying to look forward. And right now, the real focus is on what the United States can and should do in these countries, in the places that have had so far peaceful transitions to help them build their democracies, just as we once did here in Hungary 20 years ago. Um, and then, of course, in Libya, where um, it's the situation has deteriorated substantially, and, um, and there are enormous concerns and contemplations now about uh, evaluating all of the options that we have. Um, before, I will give an answer a little bit from now, but we need to keep you uh, focused on the questions that are coming in. Um, this is an interesting one. How much time has to pass them to make the U.S. realize that it will never get success in Afghanistan? What is, the, what is there in Afghanistan that makes America never give up? What kind of energy resources or other opportunities are presented by Afghanistan? Well, I, I appreciate the conspiracy theory question. Um, I had the chance to go to, op to uh, Afghanistan with the um, Hungarian... Defense Minister, Minister Hende. Uh, we went in December to visit the, the Hungarian troops. There are about 500 troops from Hungary, and they're located all over Afghanistan. There are special forces deployments. There's an OMLT and a PRT. Um, there are air trainers. Uh, amazingly, for 500 people, the Hungarians actually have a very diverse group um, doing very important things. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to go and see them with Minister Hende, and as a result, be able to see for myself what's happening on the ground, and frankly, answer that question with, with my own understanding of what I've seen. The, um, uh, first, I think it's important to say, it's not just the United States. There are 49 countries there. This is not... Um, this is a coalition that is unlike any coalition that has ever existed in the history of the world. First and foremost, because there are so many countries, including 50,000 troops from EU countries. Uh, and also, it's a coalition that is very much integrated in terms of the mission. So they are all, rather than it being a US mission with other countries sending us troops to help, this is an ISAF mission, of which the United States is one part. And so, for instance, in the Baglan province, where we went, it is um, the entire province is commanded by uh, a German commander, and the Germans have the lead there. Uh, in fact, when I was in Kabul, the Kabul airport is under a Hungarian commander, and his deputy is an American. So. This kind of integration is what we heard again and again. And people would say to me, the fact that the United States has agreed to this kind of structure has created the kind of cooperation among the allies and the partners who are there that is, is really very new and, and very, very strong. As to what we hope to accomplish, um, you know, I remember... Um, 
now eight years ago, turning on my television and saying that the government had released a um, statement that we should all go out and buy duct tape and plastic sheeting. They put a list up on the television screen of what we were supposed to buy. People in small towns across America were going shopping so they could protect their house against a terrorist attack. The fear that was used in order to move policies forward, and, and I want to be careful here because it's not my intention to go back and, and criticize previous governments, but there was this element of fear. President Obama has not been trying, nor will he try, to justify Afghanistan by scaring the countries, the United States and countries in Europe. That is, that is not his intention. But I truly believe that the reason why Afghanistan is a priority for so many of these countries who are there on the ground is that they recognize and understand that the threat that exists there is real and that we need to do something about it. And you might ask, well, how did this threat come to be? Afghanistan is, is a poor, underdeveloped country. How can this country be such a threat to our freedom and democracy in the, in the West? And the fact is that people individuals, institutions from outside of Afghanistan have poured money into this region in order to develop the madrasas and the schools and the institutions and foster them using Afghans, uh, many of whom have were terrorized by previous wars there, including uh, the war with, uh, with the Soviets. So, uh, so that's what has taken, that's what's emerged in this region of the world. And we recognize that if you look all around the world at any area which has an operation which is funded and which is sophisticated and which is determined to, to hurt, you know, cause harm, be a threat to Europe and to the United States. This is where it is. Let's, sh let's shift gears just in the last five minutes that we have. Here's a, here's a sort of uh, serious but fun question. Has your work changed since the WikiLeaks revelations? <laughs> well, in fact, I think I kind of touched a little bit on that. I, I almost said when I was talking about the work of diplomats around the world and what we do that it's maybe understood and known a little bit better in, these last, uh, in this last year. Yes, of course things have changed, but um, I think that in general there was an understanding that, um, that classified diplomatic communications are essential to any government and that um, while it's very important that I don't verify in any way any of the documents, you understand, I mean classified documents are classified documents if they're leaked or not. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it was all kind of put in perspective. So in terms of damaging our relationships with our allies, not so much. In terms of putting people who talk to Americans and talk to us in these very large institutions that are our embassies, uh, it, has, it, it has put people at risk. And, um, you know, those who think of the WikiLeaks, the people behind WikiLeaks, as these vigilantes fighting for transparency, that's just, not what, that's just not what that was all about. It's just not. What it was about, what, what the net effect of, uh, of what they did is they took people who truly are trying to fight for transparency and are trying to fight for better circumstances in their countries and turn to the United States for help, it put those people in danger. And it set back, it set back the efforts of, of trying to advance uh, the goals of, of, of the free world. You know, of course, we're not gonna let it get us down. You can just keep, keep going. But uh, that's it. So two more, I think, before we, we, we agreed that we'd be finished by about four. One will take us to a 
nearby part of the world. Um, could you briefly evaluate or tell us about the Obama administration's Russia policy and its implications for Central Europe? Mm -hmm. And then the final one, which is going to be fun for you, what were your personal expectations when taking over the embassy? And what would you like to achieve during your term in Budapest? Wow, OK. Uh, the first one, Russia. Well, I think, um, I, I think most of you may have gleaned by this point that the Obama administration considers our Russian reset, our reset with Russia, as one of the most um, successful of the Obama administration's initiatives. And the fact of the matter is that we still disagree with Russia on plenty of things. But the relationship between the United States and Russia had, uh, had deteriorated to the point that even in areas where we agreed, even in areas where we had the same view, uh, in areas where we had the same <clears throat> interests, uh, the, there was no possibility of working together because the relationship had simply deteriorated to that point. So uh, Secretary Clinton and President Obama were pretty clear early on that we were missing an opportunity to be able to work together in important areas. And since the reset, there has been progress made in working with Russia in key areas. And I think most of you know that Iran is, um, is the most, uh, the best example of that. How um, Central Europe can and should view it, I think that now, I mean, I think that there was initially some concern, um, particularly relative to the change for missile defense in Central Europe. But now, two years into this administration, I think that it's pretty clear with Central European countries what, where the bright lines still exist with Russia. And, um, and that if uh, Central European countries to some degree see a bit of a reset in their own relations, I think it's very much um, the same that I described with the United States, which is that in areas where you can work together and make progress, you seize those opportunities. But it doesn't change um, fundamental uh, uh, beliefs about Europe's security or um, NATO or, or, or anything else. And then no. Budapest and the embassy. Oh, my goodness. I feel like I should be given a day to think about that. <laughs> um, I, when I came here, I had a whole list of goals and ideas. And then I got here. And of course, all of that goes out the window, and you just start working and, and dealing with things as they arise. Um, my main goal was to, um, uh, to be able to make sure that our embassy, which as I mentioned before, is a substantial uh, operation, um, that, that, that we were doing the best that we could do in all fields, that we were, um, that our, our uh, State Department officials, our attaches, our locally employed staff um, were able to work in an environment where they're really happy and able to produce good work. And, and that was really a lot of fun. And because I have a master's in business administration, I thought, well, I should at least take a look at the management side of things. And, and, uh, uh, and, and what I found there, frankly, are that we have these really great engaged people. I mean, you'd be surprised. Ed here, Ed Lou, he speaks beautiful Hungarian. I mean, challenge me. Go and talk to him afterward. But we, <laughs> oh, he, he'll, he's up for the challenge. He's up for the challenge. Um, and uh, we have very highly trained individuals who impress me all the time. And working with them has been one of the most satisfying experiences of my life. Um, but, uh, but what I recognized coming in fairly soon was that Hungary was in a moment of great transition. Um, the Bainai government had initiated significant reforms um, in order to comply with the agreements relative to the um, financial um, package that, ha they, that Hungary had, uh, had uh, put together not too long before. And uh, the austerity measures that the Bainai government uh, had to institute were clearly um, difficult, difficult for the citizens of Hungary, difficult for balancing the budget. And, um, 
and and I was I was happy to have a chance to get to know Gordon Bynai and understand what uh, major drastic changes he had to put into place mm -hmm. during his year here. Um, but it was very clear by the time I came that there was that the elections were going to change things significantly, and they have. And so for us, uh, primarily, um, you know, we're here to try to be helpful. Um, we're here to try to find ways that we can help make Hungary stronger. Because if Hungary is stronger, if the economy is settled, if things are working well here, then we are able to turn our attention to how we can work together outside of Hungary and the United States in doing good things elsewhere in the world. So really, it goes back to, to what I, the remarks that I made uh, when I, we first uh, started here an hour ago, which is that's really the name of the game, is that our bilateral relationships with Hungary are based on how we can work cooperatively outside of Hungary. And therefore, when we, uh, when we are brought in on, on, the, on the things that are happening inside of the country, our objective is just simply to try to be helpful wherever we can. And I'll also say one other thing, and that is that I did not expect that I would like it here so much. <laughs> I didn't really know what to expect from Hungary. My husband had been here in 1989, and he had this incredible experience. I mean, this really this experience that shaped him for his life, which was seeing a people rise up and demand the, the ability to control their own fate and to, be, to have a government by the people, of the people, for the people. And so when it was uh, one of the countries that the White House asked us um, uh, to go to, he just didn't even want to talk about any others. And Budapest was on the list. That's where we have to go. And I, I, uh, I uh, have great faith in my husband's opinions, um, but I really didn't know what to expect. And I, I, I find this such a, such a warm and wonderful country. I think people here are so capable, um, you know, and so often unsung. And so when, uh, when I came here and someone said, well, you know, the highest per capita number of Nobel Prize winners in sciences comes from Hungary, it's like, Really? You know, I mean, I have to say, I didn't even know that Rubik's Cube came out of Hungary. Now I've met Mr. Rubik, and, and not just meeting him, I've understood why the Rubik's Cube came out of Hungary, you know, whether it's the language or whether it's the thinking. But I really, I, I really have great admiration for the Hungarian people. I think that this country has been through a lot. And, uh, and more than anything, as people try to describe um, why, you know, the decisions particularly related to the 20th century. And being with a background in real estate, I'll tell you, you know, location, location, location. <laughs> um, and there have been some very, very, very sad, difficult things that have happened here. The people of this country who I have met have impressed me so much. The young people impress me so much. And the only thing that makes me feel this, this motivation when I go out and I speak to students, particularly high school students, is I just want to pound my fist and say, you can do anything. You can do anything you want to do. You can study anywhere you want to study. You can study anything you want to study. You can say anything you want to say. You can change your country however you want to change it. Now is your time. And I like to say that, and I tell my American friends, remind people of that, because it's only been 21 years since that wasn't true. And that the most important thing that we as Americans can do and that Europeans can do when we come here is to remind you and remind the young people of Hungary that the future belongs to them. It helps that it seems very true to me. I was, I was tempted to la ask a final question, which I won't, but I'll tell you what the question was, and now I know what the answer is. 
The question was, what do you enjoy most about being ambassador in Hungary? And the answer is everything. <laughs> Thank you so much.